Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 176 for Monday, August 16th, 2018. Thanks, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here, as usual, in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? I'm doing good, man. It's a Monday afternoon. I had a lot of music last week and uh, a lot of interesting experiences, and I'm happy to be talking to you about it, my brother. Yeah, man. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we had a fling gig last week that was actually went really, really well. Um, in most ways. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's good to be here and I'm looking forward to, to more of that this weekend. So, yeah. Man. Cool. So I'll, I'll catch up. So All right. we started last Thursday with a, uh, a concert series around here and I actually met a, a nice guy, a gig gab listener, Doug from the band sound decision. I want to say, uh, came up and said hi and said that he really enjoys that we do this. And so hi Doug. And thanks for saying hi. Uh, we played a, one of the, one of the more popular concert series around here. And we've actually really, you know, leveraged it. I mean, we, we bring a lot of people to an already crowded one. Sure. And we, ha- we started off the weekend with one of those nights where we owned it from downbeat to, uh, to encore. I mean, we just, we, it was only a 90 minute show and 90 minute shows we kill the 90 minute shows where people are, don't have any warm up time. A lot of these concert series we do, they have a glass of wine, they eat their dinner, you know, they're picnicking for the yeah. first half hour of it. Yeah. This is party from down one. And it's just one of those ones that's really fun because when we get there, you know, at three o'clock, three quarters of the park is already filled with chairs and blankets, people reserving their space. And so, you know, you just the vibe of excitement of how dense it's going to be starts pretty early from when we get there on. That's awesome. But we, yeah, we played great and uh, it was a lot of fun and we rock and rolled. And then we get to Saturday night, which is one of the more unique experiences of my of my life was uh, we uh, opened for the legendary Eddie money. Oh, nice, man. Yeah. I saw your pictures on Facebook. That's awesome. So a couple of cool stories to share. So the first thing is this really, really nice guy, uh, our band back in 2011, I want to say we won a contest that the, the local rock and roll radio station did called um, last band standing. Oh uh, yeah. So I there was that. A, yeah. 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 It was a cover band contest. You send in your demos and people vote on them. And then, you know, the last three get to perform and then they select a winner from that. And we won it the last time that the radio station has it. And that was kind of cool. Cause we got to use it. We got a good gig out of it. We got to open for Greg Ken. Um, we uh, got to say we won best band in the Bay area, which is what they, they would say. And, you know, yep. we use that in our marketing materials to this day. But um, when we did that, one of the guys who was a promoter for the concert for the winners of this contest was a really nice guy named Mike Beard, who, you know, he was into us then. I hadn't heard, heard from him since. And then he happened to be at a gig we were playing last month and he kind of rediscovered us, really liked us. And he went to his friend who was a promoter who was going to be promoting this Eddie Money gig, which was a uh, part of the Santa Clara County Fair. Got it. So county fair gig, they wanted an opening band with some draw. They wanted an opening band that could, you know, get people excited. Uh, Mike uh, forwarded us. We, we sent in our, our demo stuff. Uh, Money's management had to approve us. They turned down a bunch of bands before. Hmm. They approved us, which was, you know, that was flattering. That's in and nice in, it, in and of itself. Yeah, that's killer. Yeah. yeah. I, I highly doubt Eddie had any, you know. Of course. Th- yeah. He right? didn't hear you until the gig. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's right. it. So anyway, um, but in that process of submitting our stuff and talking to the promoter, red flags were going off all over the place. Now, I was prepared. You know, we've been through this. We've opened up for Greg Kent twice, Starship once, Wang Chung once. I mean, we've been through this and we get the it's not about us. And so, you know, it's good. That's that's the the key to those types of gigs when you because we started getting those when I was in college. Um, You know, we were the like far and away the most popular band on campus. So we would get the opening slot for whoever it was that was touring through. And it was, I mean, it was great, right? We did a lot of them. It was awesome. But, you know, we're excited about the first one, which I think was the band Luna, right? And and they were, you know, big in the 90s. And it was like, okay, yeah. cool. We get to open for Luna. And, you know, we actually, we noticed a couple of things, right? The first was exactly as you said, it's not about you. 
right? And not even a little. Not, not at all. Even a little. <laughs> even though, you know, you might have more fans on campus right? than that band. It's also still not about you, even though it might be about you. Don't yes. think for a second that it's about you, right? And and the other thing was was that was the first time we experienced contract riders because our singer not only was he our singer in our band, but he happened to be on the con the concert organizing committee, and so he got like the rider, you know, from these guys, and it was like you know there must be X amount of food in the in the back room and all that stuff. And he had to call their management and say, look, our, you know, our budget doesn't allow for this. And their management was like, oh, yeah, nobody ever does that for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you learn about. You learn. Don't. Yeah. You learn yeah. about what the top level bands do. And again, I had a little experience this, you know, booking some pretty good bands through Macworld and going yeah, through writers. That's right. and negotiating you did the contracts. same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. And you kind of learn. It's like anything else. There's a buying price and a selling price. And, you know, if the two meet, you got a deal. And if the two don't meet, you don't have a deal. But but this one was interesting. So. As I'm negotiating with the actual promoter. So the guy who referred us to the gig, great guy, very complimentary, was just trying to do us a solid and, you know, put us forward for this. And his buddy, who was the promoter of this actual gig, um, nice enough guy, but all sorts of weird red flags, mm. you know, like like a, a long delay in getting back to us and confirming this. Um, a long, long delay in responding to our tech needs, you know, again, all yeah. I wanted to do was, was not come off badly. Right. I just of course. Wanted, yeah, I wanted yeah, to yeah. sound good. It's a shared goal at that point. Right. And nobody wants you right. to sound bad. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, a long time to agree to the money. Right. And so as this is going on, I'm telling the band dudes, do you want to do this? And they were like, yeah, it'd be cool. You know, it's local hero and that type of thing. And I was like, all right, just be prepared this one is even different because the other ones that we did where we opened, we knew the promoter, we work with them on many gigs where we're headliners and that's a solid done deal. And you know, those have been actually pretty easy, not about us, but I mean, but not, you have a working a relationship. Way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did starship. They brought in like a really nice RV as a green room for us, really nice. nicely catered. And, you know, they really took care of us and, it, you know, it makes you feel great and, you know, kind of justifies all the hard work you do to get a gig like that. And that was cool. We get out, the times were set. We did our gig. We did our work. We did our job. We get off and that's it. Yep. This one though, like I said, the, the promoter style was a lot more loose. In fact, one time he was like, that gig's three weeks away. Why do we need to talk about it now? And I'm oh, like, oh, yeah, I can, I, I can imagine that freaking anyone out. I, I know you well enough to yeah. know that that's like not okay in your world. Yes. Right. <laughs> and so the whole time I'm cool. It's an open night. I'm going back to the band saying, I'm just telling you guys, if you want to do this, you're going to have to hold on to your hats because it's going to be a weird one. And uh, so we're going along and, you know, we agreed in money. Yeah. He, I say, you're going to send me a contract. He goes, I don't do contracts. I said, what do you mean you don't do contracts? He goes, I don't sign them and I don't, I don't issue them. I said, you probably sign one for Eddie. He goes, that's different. He goes, what do you want? <laughs> of course it he is. He said, he said, if you feel better, send it to me an email and I'll respond that I got the email. And that's essentially what this contract was. But again, sure. It wasn't enough money and it wasn't enough services that I was going to sweat it. The band wanted to do it for the experience of doing it. And, yep. and you know, big stage gig that to it. Anyway. For, for, for those of you listening, though, uh, an email with both confirmation and then performance and performance being starting to do the things that, that were discussed in the email. That's just as good as an inked signature on a piece of paper. Right. Just so, I, not that you ever want to, if it gets to the point where you have to worry about that distinction, you've already lost in so many ways, right? Yeah. Well, it'll cost you more to collect than it, it will. It, to totally. Walk away. Totally. But just so everybody knows I, that, that an email, especially an email with performance, it, I mean, a handshake with performance is also considered a contract. It's just a little harder to prove that the handshake happened. Uh, right. But yeah, but there you go. Yep. All right. So we've got something in digital writing now and, and, you know, essentially everything except the sound system is agreed to time, sure. you know, details like load in and, you know, parking yeah. and stuff like that. He, that he was not going to give that to me until the week of the gig. So I'm just Fine. again telling the band, okay. just hold on guys. Just roll. Anyway. So the next thing that happens is as we get closer and I'm asking, I need a decision about, are we going to get what our stage plot needs for our sound? So we send it in. A couple of days go by. 
he's asked for our logo after we had an agreement on money. And I said, I'll send you the logo because I know you got to print some stuff, but we have to get the rest of the stuff agreed to. So he had my logo and all of a sudden it appears in a TV ad and a print ad and a, you know, and a video that's going around. So, you know, opening band, the house rocker. So, you know, again, I would have, I would have walked if, even with that stuff out there, I mean, I'm saying it now, but yeah, of but, course. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if the sound stuff would have ended up not working, but we get a note about 10 days for the gig. Um, Eddie doesn't want you to touch his board. Doesn't want you to touch his monitors. You know, we're going to have to do something else. I was Under- like, that's okay. understandable. Sure. Well, even the board, like they can't, they can't well, save, if it's, save if it's a, a scene. Or yeah. Something. If it's a digital board, you should be able to save a scene. Yes, for sure. But so yeah. none yeah. of their sound stuff could be done anyway. So I'm like, well, what are you going to do? And he says, well, you know, we'll still take care of it. We want it to happen. We'll do what's on your, on your stage plot. We will bring in a separate board and separate monitors Yep. and, and we'll you know do our thing. So, all right. So again, I'm communicating with the band. This is weird. And they're like, we're good. You know, if nothing else, as long as we can hear each other, we can get through the gig and we'll say we did it. So um, we get there and they, they did, they provided the board, you know, it was that Behringer X32 and, and, you know, additional wedges and, and, uh, our bill, you know, again, the great bill, everybody needs a bill was there to not only get our wireless stuff set up, but he actually ran the board. He didn't have familiarity using this particular board, but the sound crew was cool and they were helpful sure. and, and they I, were supportive. I will tell you that that's a board worth having familiarity with folks. It that's what everybody is, says. It is in use everywhere. It, it's the weirdest thing. I, and the Midas older brother. Of yeah, the, well, it's I, I don't know if it's older or younger. It's the it's the the it's the more bigger, professional. Yes, yeah, the more yeah. professional brother. But it's like I think it's even the same mic preamps in both the Behringer and the Midas. No, no, that's the difference. Is uh, that the is that no. the Midas has a really nice mic preamps? I thought they were using the Midas pre- mic preamps in the Behringer. I was just talking to somebody about this, but that, that's what I thought too. And and I was corrected on that. There's something else in like the number there's this, of outputs. There's a digital snake. Yes, correct. That's right. Yeah. It's the digital snake is available on the Midas. But I was th- told that the mic preamps was a thing. Yeah, I was too. I was too. But I was corrected about that. And 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 who knows? The person who corrected me might have been wrong. But um, but it's worth not only learning that board, but it, especially if you're a musician that that works a lot of different gigs. Go download the apps for the X32. You'd only need to download the Behringer ones if you're on iOS. They like there's third party apps that you can pay for, but the free ones are fine. On Android, you actually need to pay for something because the the my, the the native apps suck. But uh, go learn those apps and learn how the board works. It's a little bit weird, but it is so common at so many gigs, and it's a really powerful board. The thing that makes it weird is the flexibility that you can use to kind of route things and manage them. But man, like it is a board worth having a working knowledge of because you will run into it at a gig at some yeah. point. So go download the app and, and, and mess with that and learn the difference between when you see the board in normal fashion, where you're mixing the mains. And then when you hit the sends on faders button, it jumps. And now you're mixing on the same layout. You're mixing the, the various different monitor mixes, you can choose which one. So learn not only how that works, but how to identify it quickly. So you don't wind up mixing the wrong thing. So there but you not go. only that, like yeah. one of the big reasons it was recommended to us. So, so we've been, um, using the, the, um, you have the personas, right? For your personas, band. right. Yeah. But you know, we have a couple of friends who are pro sound people who are really saying that it's a great idea. And one of the great reasons is you can save a scene and you can save a scene to a USB Yes. Thing, and, and take that to someone else's board, plug it in and your, your all your settings go with you. Yep. And the apps, I think the settings would go back and forth between any flavor of the Behringer or Midas, you know, 32 series boards because of the X and the R and all those. Uh, but also, you know, the apps work the same. So one app works on, on both of those boards and all of them and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's it's become sort of the de facto standard out there. And it's a good board. I mean, it's it's very powerful. Yeah. Yep. People yep. are into it. Yeah. All right. So now we move to uh, it's show day. Our call time is five o'clock. Our call time is four o'clock. Our sound check time is five o'clock. Doors open at six o'clock, and we're supposed to play at six thirty. So um, we get there on time. We load in, no problem. Security is fairly light, but there's not a lot going on back there that you need a lot of security. But it, it didn't keep other people from just kind of walking in and you know that yeah. type of thing but um 
Eddie's sound guy is on stage and he's a real pro and you know, he's, he's, he's really tuning the system to exactly how he wants it for Eddie or however Eddie sure. wants it. And, um, you know, does a very good job and, um, very thorough, but goes a little long. And so where our sound time is cut into now, remember there's a hard stop because yep, door, the show's got to start. Sick. You got it. Right. Anyway, we finally get the stage. We get up there and, and when I should pause and say, uh, the only guy from Eddie's band. So this was a kind of a weird thing. I don't know if you know this, but Eddie actually has a reality show on right now. And in his band, his daughter sings, his son plays guitar and sings and, and another son plays drums. And the reality show is, is ostensibly about that, about, you know, Eddie and having his, this family sure. that plays in his band with him. And it's on Access TV. I think, and, it's, called, you know, it's, actually, it's, I think it's called Real Money, right? Real Money. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, so uh, none, of the, none of the family is there for the sound check, but the guitar player in the band who's handling really kind of the heavy chores, he was there. Really nice guy, really uh, thoughtful, complimentary, younger guy. Um, I was asking him a lot about tone and, you know, because he sounded great. And, uh, you know, so it's just kind of cool to meet, you know, someone from the band who was actually there doing the sound check. So anyway, we get the stage a little bit late, eh, 5, 5, 15, 520, scramble to get us up there. It's a very wide stage, not a terribly deep stage, but um, we got roughly half of it, the front half, and Russ was literally, his drum set was right up against me. I mean, it oh, was, yeah. that's the typical stage opening was. band yeah. set up. Yep. You got a wide stage, but they took most of the depth. So here's what you yep. get. Yep. Yep. Steve is, Steve is, you know, where Steve sits up, he was kind of on the far back corner. Bill is mixing stage for us. And, uh, you know, it was a new system for him. And, you know, there were a couple, you know, but, but you know, we got through it. Okay. Yeah. We get through it. We run a sound check song. We're fairly happy. Um, and uh, doors are supposed to open at six. And the promoter sends someone out to say, hey, maybe maybe you guys can start at seven. Uh -oh. Right. And we're like, seven. Is he that goes, yeah, you know, we're going to shorten your set, though. We're getting there. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so so the thing is. Um, uh, they didn't plan when the activities at the county fair were going to end so the fair participants could come into this concert right. and they wanted a dance to start and so they asked us could we start you know start a little bit later so it was really supposed to be seven and then they moved to seven fifteen, and i'm like so the deal was it was supposed to be us for an hour and then eddie money's the band but not eddie singing the son playing his originals for 20 minutes and then eddie comes on and then, so I'm thinking in my mind, you're like, how did they communicate this to the rest of the people? And doesn't this set the whole schedule back? <laughs> and, and net, net, they just messed up the schedule. Right. So right. we were never supposed to start at six 30. We were supposed to start at seven 30. Oh. So anyway, we roll with it. We're dealing with it. It's just, you know, it's just one of those things where it's stressful enough and that type of thing is weird, but people are coming in, you know, the excitement's building. It's a beautiful night. Uh, we get in there and we play and it's, you know, still pretty light out when we start the gig and it's kind of dusky when we finish our part of the gig, but we get in, we play, we're playing really well. We're starting to go over. Uh, we're starting to like, we had, you know, we had maybe a hundred people who were fans of ours that we knew in the audience uh, out of an audience of maybe three or 400 people. So not, not a bad ratio, oh, right? That's pretty good. So yeah, we yeah, brought yeah. in a fair number of people. Those, those numbers are rough, but sure. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, you know, we get to go out and between, between when we're done and people coming in, we get to greet a lot of people Anyway, so we take the stage, you know, nice applause, you know, we get going, we're starting to cook, we're getting going, we're getting going, we, you know, we really are getting going. And then the guy comes side stage, his last song, and yep. we're about only about two thirds sort of thing. We're like, what? And so we I heard him and, uh, you know, a little bit of a chat while a guy in the, on stage right was taking a solo between me and Nick and Steve because the, the message went into Nick because he was on that side of the stage. he's over there, sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Nick relays it to me. Steve is clearly, you know, he put a lot of effort into this and was really, you know, amped to play it. And uh, so, you know, we did one extra song, right? So, okay. so we should have stopped, but, you know, our one little rebellious act was to play one extra song. <laughs> We get this off. Is, People this are, is this is how we uh, m my band lost an opening slot for the Spin Doctors. I'm you know? sure. Yeah, yeah. It was was we were playing a gig, and the, like halfway through our set, the promoter came up and he's like, "You guys are great. 
I'm going to put you on the bill with the spin doctors in, you know, three weeks or whatever. And this was when they were freaking huge, right? You know, back in the 90s. And then the end of the gig comes and and their interpretation of the end was a little earlier than ours. And our lead singer decided, yeah, well, let's do an extra couple of songs. And, yeah. and so for half of our it. half of our set, we had this opening slot for the spin doctors locked up yeah, and yeah, we yeah. proceeded to snatch uh, victory from the jaws of uh, or snatch there defeat from the jaws of victory. Yeah, exactly. So we had about a, a 14 or 15 song set planned and at about song eight, um, maybe a song seven. Uh, and remember, this is kind of a big open football field where the where the show was open field. Um, clearly, Eddie's, you know, SUV comes in and they get out and all of a sudden everybody is standing up and looking to the side where, you know, Eddie's coming in. Right. So anyway, uh, Eddie gets out. I don't see Eddie, but the daughter who is kind of a big personality, she's dressed ready for the gig. You know, she's really pretty. And, and, and she comes out and she has her, her own fans. Cause she's on this reality show. Oh, she's right. a big personality on this reality show. And like a bunch of people had kind of gotten up from where they were sitting watching us and they run over to the side gate to kind of like get a glimpse of her. See, and then she starts coming over and then more people get over there. So anyway, you know, the, in my mind, I'm just like shaking my head and laughing. It's not about us. It's just like, <laughs> yep. right. Not about us. And yep. the guys in, on the, on stage, you know, we were like, this was like, yep, not about us. And it wasn't like, a, it was like a heavy thing. It was more like an acknowledgement. Like, yeah, you just laugh as, it off. As, right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of like as big a, as big a fish as we may think we are on occasion in our little town, you know, it's not that big a fish, you know, like, nope. like, you know, <laughs> no, <problem. It's>, yep, <laughs> anyway, nope. so that's, that's maybe song seven or eight. Yeah. And then yeah. two more songs and we get the word and then we played one more song. And so I can't tell you now, Dave, whether, because I'd like to think we were playing pretty darn well. That's why they, the, the manager. So the promoter after the gig says to me, um, you know, sorry, I know I cut you off, but I got the call. I got that text message from the manager to, to shut it down. Yep. And I don't know why. I still don't know why. Were we going over too well? Did they want the crowd to go over to the side of the stage and mingle with the daughter? Or, you know, what, what was the deal? I couldn't uh, tell. So we get off and, uh, you know, guys were in different, different places of, yep, it's not about us and fine with it. And like, oh man, we were just getting going and it was getting good. Uh, so the, each individual guy in the band was somewhere on that spectrum, right? Sure. And uh, so we, we get off, we load off fairly quickly. You know, I would be further to the right of disappointed because we were really just starting to cook. And um, that's how it goes, though. The opening band's yeah, not supposed to yeah. cook that much. Yep. I guess so. I, I and uh, I don't know. I don't really anticipate a life looking to hook up as an opening band. You know, so we, I, we my played in, uh, the band I was in, in the same band in college. We played a gig opening for. Uh, I'll call them regional celebrities. Like they were a pretty big band and, um, and we played a gig opening for them in our mutual hometown and we killed it. I mean, we were, it was like, <laughs> we were just on fire this night. It's just, you know, some nights, good nights. Yep. And this yep. just happened to be a good night at a, like at a great gig for us. And it really got us a lot of, a lot of exposure. And I mean, we got paid for it too, but you know, it was good on many levels. And backstage after the show, you know, we were very friendly with this other band and the drummer kind of pulled me and our singer aside. And he's like, just so you know, he's like, you guys were awesome tonight. He's like, we will never have you open for us again. And he was laughing because we're really good friends and still good yeah. friends to this day. But he was dead serious about this. And and yep. he was right. It never happened yep. again. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, so the next couple stories are, um, so I grab my stuff, pack up. And, uh, you know, I'm parked cl pretty close by the stage, but behind a gate in a parking lot. And I go out and uh, I'm kind of calmed down by now. Sure. And literally, I'm in the parking lot kind of by myself throwing, throwing some guitars in a car. And all of a sudden, I hear this very thick accent. Hey, you guys were cooking. You know, he was like, great set. Sounded like the 70s in the East Bay soul. I turn around, it's Eddie Money. Yeah. And I don't know whether he saw me and he followed me out there because there's no one else around. And there was no reason for him to be out there. Uh, I was, And, you know, I was close to the exit, but... Um, he was genuinely a nice, nice guy. Very sincerely complimentary. Let me take a picture with him. And uh, it was just really cool. So any any tenseness I felt just evaporated entirely. And, and uh, you know, he was genuinely complimentary, and uh, which was really nice to That's hear. That's awesome. That's and then, great. you know, his son did his 20-minute set. 
And I, what I would have said, to, I, 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 we talked for a few minutes because we're both from New York, uh, and uh, we talked a little bit about you know Bay Area music, and you know he was just he was just a cool guy, and um, he clearly is making a very conscious effort that he's using his life to help his kids get started. I mean, the reality show is about his kids. He, you know, he comes on and he says, my, my son Des is going to do a set and I'll be up in 20 minutes. And, you know, so he basically MCs for his son. And then, you know, he comes back on and his, and his kids are still in the band playing for him. And, you know, he's promoting t-shirts for his kids. And, uh, you know, I, I, my interpretation is a very, very conscious thing. And I guess, you know what, if you're a dad, you can understand where he's coming from with that. Like he's trying to give his kids a gift of a head start on something. Totally. Uh, and you know, he, he's all in and he's, you know, given them, you know, a pretty, you know, significant opportunity. And then he came on and did his set and he sounded like Eddie money and his, and his songs were great. I, got, I heard a lot of stories when we announced the gig from people who had seen him over the years, you know, varying degrees of, of happiness, you know, yeah. he didn't remember the words or stuff. And some of that might be 2020 hindsight, but he, you close your eyes to me. It sounded like Eddie Money, and he has some great rock songs. I mean, he has some really, really great rock songs. And the band was rock solid, and and uh, the guitar player who I'd met during soundcheck was really a talented player. And um, so that was cool. I That's mean, cool. That's great. That was all right. Man. And That's then the last right. part is me right. waiting to get paid by the promoter, not knowing if it was going to happen. I found the promoter, he, and he was again. I'd never met him in person. Everything was done by text message, phone calls, and a couple emails. He was. I my intent. My interpretation is he. This was just a little bit of bigger thing than he'd done in a, in a genre that I don't think he had done. Yeah. And so the detail, and, and I think he probably got beat down with the details from the artist's requirements, and my requirements were the least important thing for him. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. He wasn't a bad guy at all. A very nice guy actually, and he paid us. You know, just like he said he would, and uh, and you know he, he provided the sound system. So at the end of the day, he did everything he said he would do. I was just gonna I have say, to, it sounds like he delivered to, to, perhaps just, just the scheduling stuff, despite the warning signs. Yeah, he was just this. It, maybe this was his first rodeo of this level, and and it just it kind of took him by surprise too. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. All, all in all, That's I would great, say man. this. It's a good experience. I mean, if anyone has the chance to do it, just to kind of see what a pro level band, how they set, you know, just to be backstage for some of that stuff is a learning experience unto itself to play big stages with gigantic sound systems. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like when you're in that semi-professional mode, it, you know, it's kind of that touch, touch with fame. That's kind of cool. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I would say I put a lot of time, like, uncompensated time to make this happen because it would be a fun thing to do, but net net gets a good experience and, you know, learn something, met a couple of cool people, got a picture with a guy who had some pretty lasting music and, uh, and uh, it was, it was definitely worth doing. So, so it's, so it's, it's is, a good story all in all. Yeah. This is interesting. Cause a lot of times we'll talk about, you know, don't do a gig for exposure. Don't do a gig as an audition. Don't, you know, like that. In fact, we, I just, this morning we, from on our gig gab, page on on facebook i posted something or I, sh- I shared something that dan east who's been a guest on our show here posted and it was exactly that like don't take these gigs but the one thing that i'm hearing from you that's different from that is you did it i mean you got paid but but you know perhaps not enough to compensate for all the time that you that you put into this but um there's an experience level, right? Of I got to do a thing and I learned from it and, and let all of that. And that actually is a reason to to go the extra mile or do a little more than, than perhaps you're getting paid for or whatever it is. If you can see that at the outset, then that's good. Don't let somebody take advantage of you for it too regularly. Although, I mean, clearly, you know, I think everybody probably knows what's going on in a scenario like this. But but that, you know, there there's a lot to learn. And I mean, you just, you know, you just spent 25 minutes telling us about it and that's... Like that's a valuable thing. So it was, yeah. You know, again, we're collecting experiences here and, you know, we're, we're, we're taking advantage of all that playing music can, can afford you. I would say this is definitely a plus, you know, you just got to be prepared. It's not about you as a thing you have to say over and over and over again. Yes. I learned that not only, well, I learned that the first time it, it gigs like you're talking about, and then I experienced it again and, and recognized it. Thankfully, when we played the first time I played gigs at uh, Foxwoods Casino down in Connecticut, it was like, oh, right. 
we're just the cog in the wheel here. You know, there's a lot of other things happening and we are serving a purpose and that's it. You know, you might think for a second it's about you. And in fact, the people out there might think it's about you. But guess what? It ain't about you. Yeah. So I, I would just love to know why they cut us off. It would be interesting if we were playing too good. It'd be interesting if uh, they just wanted it to be dead time. So yeah. there could be, you know, excitement buzzing on the side of the stage. I, I have no idea. And I would love to know it. But you may um, never know the answer. In fact, you will likely never know the answer yeah, to that. I'll never know. We got cut off. Uh, we played a gig uh, once a year. The town of Durham, where I live, closes off Main Street and all the kind of shop owners set up out in the street. And, the you know, people come down and, and, and a band plays, which is usually us last year. We couldn't do it because of our schedule, but, um, and it's just a really nice time. It's a really great thing. And it's been growing year over year. And so we got there and we set up and, you know, it was great. At the band sounded good. It sounded good on stage. It sounded good off stage. We were playing really well. I talked last week about the songs that that we had added. Um, we we threw "Burning for You" in there, and then we even threw that police song that we were messing with, the "When the World Is Running Down." And everything was going really well. And we took a set break because we had to because they had some announcement at like seven p.m. or whatever. And that's when the rain came. Oh boy. Yep. Yep. And there was no rain in the forecast, but it's New England. So that's that doesn't you know, the forecast is not gospel here. It's just, you know, a suggestion of what might happen. And um, and it was a bummer having to pack up in the you know, there's a lot of gigs where if you told me halfway through, hey, man, guess what? You get paid. Go home. Uh, like I'd be like, great, sweet. Bye. But not this one. I was like, oh, man, like everything was going really well. But um but yeah, it was, it was, you know, it's, it's, it's nice playing those community gigs and, um, and it was a bummer to see it go, but you know, that's how, that's, that's how outdoor gigs in new England goes. So it's just, yeah, that that's, it's way more risky for you than it is for me. I way mean, more risky. Yeah. 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 Crazy man. It's great, but it's, but it was fun, you know, and it, we had a, I mean, we had a good mix and, uh, tried out some new stuff and everybody just locked right in and the town was all out. There were a ton of people there, which is great. It was really, really good. And we got another one, you know, a gig coming up on, uh, at down at the beach at Hampton beach on, on Saturday that we're looking forward to, too. I think nighttime. Yeah. 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 Nighttime indoor nighttime gig. Yeah. 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 Which is, which is that that's always fun. Cause that's the one right next door to the venue that they call the casino ballroom. So, um, we play and there's usually people, you know, a lot of actually quite a few people just there for the sake of being at this club and seeing us. And I think we've got a bunch of people coming out. But then uh, at about 1030, the whatever the concert is that's happening next door this weekend, it's a band called Incubus um, that lets out. And then we make sure we're playing when that lets out so that we can draw people in. And then it becomes like the party goes times 10 at that point, which is really kind of fun. Um, to, to manage that. And, and, you know, it's a whole different mindset, right. Of, okay, we're playing like a, you know, I don't want to call it a laid back gig, but you know, it's the energy's at one level. And so you kind of flow with the energy of that at that level. And then suddenly it goes to 10 times that level. It's like, okay, got to keep going. Got to keep, got to manage this. You know, these people that are walking in just came out of a two hour rock show. So you got to like, now you have to be at that level go <laughs> so which is cool Crazy. it's fun yeah, yeah it's fun yeah 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 yep yep um did you were you gonna say something i have a whole other topic to talk about go okay so you uh i, I don't know maybe this happened on facebook maybe it was a private text but i don't think it's too private for us to for me to share here but uh you played a gig a couple weeks ago i think it was a wedding and it sounded like they requested a fish song. And so you, you, you guys played Julius for this. And I say yep. it sounded like they requested it because the, in the video that you sent me of it, the people were singing along, which is not a normal scenario with a fish song. So, it, you know, it, it, I assume that that's what happened. Is that right? So, um, uh, it's funny you bring this up. So, uh, the wedding was for a friend of Nick's and Nick is, uh, yes. you know, a, a jam band guy, my right. keyboard player and, uh, his circle of friends are certainly jam band aficionados and enthusiasts, large grateful dead community and fish certainly as well. And this was requested a while ago and, you know, we kind of tooled with it and then, uh, we really played it for, um, Nick's 50th birthday party that we did two years ago. That's right. And so we, we had the chart and, you know, we we're ready to go. And then, you know, he wanted to add it into the set this year. And so, 
it has to be the right place, right? So whenever we play in the Santa Cruz area, which is a pretty big you know, jam band community, that this song comes out. And in certain other places when we're going to show off the band, because I think you hear like we have a really cool, big, in-your-face uh, horn chart for it. Yeah, well, yeah, that I mean, that's Fish's horn chart that you guys are playing. It's great. But it, I think I mean, they have a three-piece horn section playing on it. We have a five-piece horn section playing on it. Uh, me. Yeah, when I've seen them play it live, I've seen them with five. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. But, anyway, but yeah. I don't know what played on the album. You might be right. It might just have been three. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, we were playing this for a jam band appreciative audience that uh, some of the people were part of the people who requested that we add it to our set list sure. in the beginning anyway. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was fun. That's an interesting song. Again. Well, that's what I want to talk about. Ones, I would have called, called it a vanity song because it's, it's not going to be well known often. Right. It's uh, we play it well. Nick sings it great. And it has a certain energy to it. Um, but I, I still think it's one of those songs that in terms of a placement, I'm picky about where I will put that in a set. Um, you know, again, Nick asked for it in a set. I'll usually put it in, sure. in, in, in various places. But in general, it's a it's not an every sh- it's not an every show song for us. That's right. I, I will say this. I, I feel we have a couple of fish tunes in in the fling set. Um, and. They are not, I don't see them as every show songs for exactly the same reason. The The strangest part is that no matter where we are, if we wind up pulling it out, like our bass player or guitar player will say, oh, let's play sample in a jar or whatever. It's like, okay, fine. Let's play it. There's always at least, you know, like, like I, I want to say five, maybe even 10% of, of whoever's in the audience is like comes up. And now this is their favorite moment of the set. And it shocks me every time it happens. It's like, oh, yeah, there's fish fans everywhere. They're just closeted. You know, they they won't request tunes because they don't think people know them or whatever. But you pull that stuff out and there's always somebody that's that's totally into it, you know. And um, so anyway, uh, the reason I wanted to bring this up is that uh, it, it brings up the concept of the shuffle. Right. Because Julius is is, you know, ostensibly a shuffle. It's it's got that groove to it. And. The interesting thing is there's so many different ways to play a shuffle, especially from the drummer's standpoint, but, but it really translates to everybody. You played what I consider the right way to play this particular shuffle and your drummer specifically played it the right way. He played it basically the way Fishman played it on the album, which is um, snare on two and four and swinging the, or shuffling the, the bass drum and the, and the ride cymbal. So you, on the ride cymbal and the bass drum, you've got da-da, 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 da-da. And on the, on the snare, it's two and four. So it's da dun da pa da dun da ta da dun da ta da you know. And, and that works for that song. That's not your traditional, like, Texas shuffle groove. The Texas shuffle groove is where the ride and the bass drum are playing just quarter notes, so just downbeats. And the snare drum... It, left hand on the snare, or you know, uh, usually the opposite hand, whatever it is on the snare, is playing the full shuffle or most of the full shuffle. So playing to do to pot to do to pot to do on the snare drum, and that's what you'll hear on like Stevie Ray Vaughan tunes. You know, you go listen to uh, Pride and Joy is a great example of that shuffle where it's really like either the the ride symbol is the hi hat is the quarter notes along with the bass drum just kind of driving that along, and then the snare is the thing that's that's sort of sort of pulling that and then there's and then you get into uh, and and zz tops lagrange is another example of 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 that kind of thing and that's a hard thing to get man like talk to any drummer and you know i would say eight out of ten of us will tell you uh, that the shuffle was the thing it took us the longest to get in our playing careers uh you know i was i was well into my 30s i'd started playing at 14 i was well into my 30s before i finally had that aha moment of like oh that's how you're supposed to play sh- oh crap i've been doing this wrong for a long time you know and and john fishman had that moment a fish's drummer had that moment uh, like this past year i think it was december when he finally had his aha moment he talked about it on this uh, uh it's the drummer's resource podcast i think i'll find a link it's like a three-hour interview he did with the guy but but he talked about that and he talked about oh yeah for julius i you know i finally understand how to play a shuffle and so he does now play this Texas shuffle with, you know, mostly like quarters on the right of the hi-hat and, and then shuffling on the snare. And it completely, as you might ex- expect, it completely changes the groove of the song. And Julius, to me, is one of those songs where the energy just sort of drives that thing along. And it's almost a little frantic 
Whereas that Texas shuffle makes it so much more laid back. Like the tempo can't rush. It it might be fast or it might be slow, but it's going to be like rock solid right in there. And you can't, you never get that feeling of it, like, you know, propelling you along. It's just grooving along. And we saw fish play that uh, in Tahoe when we were there, or whatever it was a couple of weeks ago. And they played it as the last song of the night, which was a, a slot that Julius often lived in. And it was really like, it just didn't go anywhere because it it was this different groove. And I almost want to think they realized that because they did something they they rarely do a few shows later. I think it was actually in San Francisco. They opened the night with it. I was like, yeah, that's a much better spot for that groove. Is And so it was just interesting listening to you guys play that. It was like, oh, interesting. So like you guys really had that drive to it. And um, I don't know if that's and intentional that, or just the way it happens, but that, you know, it works. I think it's just the way it happened. And, yeah. you know, I think that's the thing about where Russ feels that groove. Yeah, and, you exactly. know, how he it, so. yeah. And again, Russ is, Russ is incredible. And so he, he finds, he finds ways to swing things that are really unique and, mm-hmm. and, you know, he's just such a student of drums. And so I would say all hail, all hail Russ. Yeah. No, I, I really like the way he played that shuffle. Um, and, and I'd be curious to to know if it was like he consciously chose not to play like a Texas shuffle for it or what, but because these days I probably, if like if somebody brought that song into my band last year, I would have been all over playing the Texas Shuffle on it because I can play a Texas Shuffle now, right? I know how to do that. <laughs> and and now having experienced that, it's like, you know, just because you can, like, that's great that you have that in your wheelhouse, Dave, but that might not be the best thing for all opportunities where it might fit otherwise. So it's right. just, it's really interesting that the whole Shuffle thing, man, uh, it's, it's, um, and I think it's the same for guitar players too. Um, but you can, you can tell me, but like, there's that, there's there's a like a something that needs to happen in your hands, man, to make that shuffle happen. And Stevie yeah. Ray, you know, I mean, that whole band had it. Stevie had it, and Chris Layton had it, and Tommy Shant. Like the three of them, every time they got on stage, it was a masterclass. And this is how to play shuffles like this for sure. You know what I mean? It's so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you would ask me about that because I think one time we were jamming and I just kind of jumped into something and you said, oh, you have that feel. And I would say I it just dawns on me. And, you know, again, I, I think probably that is not a very common guitar rhythm style. Right. And so yeah. you know, that type of thing. And it's uh, it is all right hand and it is uh, you just have to feel it. You just have to feel the attack of the pick on the strings. Yeah. You have to feel the muting. You have to, you know, it's just a very percussive thing, but you know, I think percussion is like that. I mean, there's, a, you know, you hear African rhythms. There, there are certain rhythms that are just endemic to someone's soul that come out. You can learn them, but you know, it's very rare that that people who have to learn rhythms can groove rhythms. You can technically do them, but to really have them groove it has to be something that's in you, right? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, so that's that's all I'm saying. So for a guitar player to play like Stevie and to really just kind of like shuffle that right hand and be so percussive, you you can work on it. But, you know, there that one happens to come a little bit easier to me. And again, I'm I'm a seven out of ten out of it, but I could fake my way through it. And then there are people who are just, you know, it's like hitting a golf ball straight. Some people just walk up, you know, and just hit, hit it straight down the line. Yeah. Other people have to really, really work at it. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The show, it's it's such it sounds so easy. I, you know, I was listening to the, that that John Fishman interview about uh, where he, he was talking about shuffles. My wife and I were on like a, I don't know, a five hour road trip somewhere. I was speaking down in Philly or something and she came with me. And so I, we listened to it on part of the way. And I even said to her, I'm like, this is like major drum geek stuff. Are you sure? And she's like, well, you know, this she's like, hey, this is actually really interesting. And the, and the section about shuffles, she stopped. She's like, why is that like like this sounds easy? And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yes, I'm aware. It sounds easy. Yes, it sounds easy. <laughs> yeah, but but that's the and I always even to this day, uh, I will never choose to open a gig with a shuffle. Like if I am not warmed up, the shuffle is the most uncomfortable thing. Once I'm warmed up, it can actually be super comfortable for me now. But what about what about the superstition shuffle? See, that's not a shuffle. That's a that's straight four where he's just swinging the hi hat a little bit. But that's not a shuffle. That's not going to 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 in some way, right? That's that's 
you know, and he's he is shuffling that that snare drum kind of like it, I mean, it's a different way. But Ringo did the same thing. Like the band would be driving in straight eights and Ringo might be, you know, shuffling those eights a little bit on the hi-hat. And it creates that groove and it creates uh, especially in Superstition, the way Stevie played that drum part um, creates motion that otherwise isn't there. Right. Y- you know, and. But that's not that's not a like a, a you know a triplet rooted shuffle because um, that's actually an easy song to open the night with is superstition because yeah we do yeah that's a, that's a good one to open with but you know something like um, uh, you can't get enough of your love right oh man it's like that <laughs> groove is so hard to find or but uh, but uh, but I don't need whatever it is. Uh, uh, Whole lots of money. Too proud to beg. No, no, that's straight. Uh, I don't need a big fine car. What is it? Uh, some kind some of kind wonderful. of wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's another one. That's such a hard shuffle because the whole thing shuffles on the bass drum. Um, and really, like, yeah, I don't. I, I I have opened gigs with it. I mean, if somebody puts it on the list, I play it. But I, you will notice, I will never be the one to do that. <laughs> it's gotta gotta serve the. I, it, it's just. I, and I think it's because of what you were saying, like you, you, it's so, th- there's so many nuances to making it both feel and then sound easy and, and flowing. And for me sitting down at the kit, you know, especially if it's the first time, even if I've warmed up at home, you know, every, every time I set up my kit, things are a little bit different. And until I get things exactly in the right spot and I feel comfortable and, you know, we're talking about a half inch difference, making all the difference in the world to being right. comfortable, you know, that like, that's part of it. It's like, yeah, I can, I'll fight through it, but it's a fight, you know, until I'm comfortable. And then it's like butter, but that's what we love about playing folks. It's, yeah. you know, you get to, you have to work and sometimes it doesn't work. As well as it does others. And that's and the, sometimes you get cut off early. And sometimes you get cut off early. Yeah, man. Yeah. Let's hope that doesn't happen to either one of us this weekend. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. You got anything else, man? Or are we, uh, have we? No, good to, to share with you this, uh, this kind of interesting experience this yeah, week. So we'll, hopefully awesome. people out there will get something from it. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. That's, that's sort of the goal. That's why we, uh, that's why we do this every week. Right. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, our time has come to an end for this week. I hope you folks have a great week. Find us, giggappodcast.com. Send us email, feedback at giggappodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I do have one thing to say, especially when they tell you to stop early. Always. Oh, man. Oh, always be performing. Bring it on.